As you said, Mr. Allen, she is taking the war to the South Seas, and we are supposed to stop her. But, sir, with respect, she's a vastly heavier ship. She's out of our class. She could be halfway to Cape Horn by the time we repaired and underway. Well, then, there's not a moment to lose. <laughs> Welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where each week we enter the world of a great film. We explore its themes, the history, the filmmaking, and the influence it has on us today. My name is Steve Morris. I'm a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, everyone. My name is John Rook. I'm a writer, producer, and host and VO artist uh, here in San Diego, California, and uh, very excited to be walking aboard this ship this week, the SS Cinephiles, to talk about <laughs> this film, Master and Commander, with these two incredible guests of ours, Steve. I am too, but I'll tell you, you know, there's been time that I've been nervous about podcasts because mm. we were doing Citizen Kane or Lawrence of Arabia, you know, and when we did The Godfather, where it's like, we got to do this right. This is really important. Well, this yeah. one, I'm kind of a little nervous for a different reason, which is that these are, without question, my favorite books. Yeah. I have read them over and over and over again. This is, of course, we're doing Master and Commander, The Far Side of the World, based on the Patrick O'Brien books. And so I have a really, I think I'm usually pretty objective about the films that we talk about. And this one, it's really hard for me because those I've read those books over and over again. And in fact, because of those books, we have some very, very special guests today, which is... I was decided during the pandemic that I needed some comfort reading, you know, like I was stressed out. There's a lot of stuff going on. And when I need comfort, I go back to Patrick O'Brien. And as I'm going through the series for what might have been my sixth time through those books, I went, man, I wish there was something like a companion, something I could find to to listen to. And I went, wait a minute. There's podcasts on all sorts of TV shows. Maybe there is a Patrick O'Brien podcast on this series. Did a search. And of course, then I found The Lubber's Hole. Immediately fell in love with the podcast. And I am very, very happy to welcome the host of The Lubber's Hole, Mike Shank and Ian Bradley. Welcome to The Cinephiles. Thank you so much, Steve. It's great to be here. Um, really, really so, excited. Thanks for having us along. Yeah. So normally, my first question is, how did you come to the film? But I'm curious for the two of you, how did both of you come to Patrick O'Brien? I have a two-word answer, so I'll give you mine first. You and John, it's Ian Bradley. That's, <laughs> that's, that's very kind. I'm very honored to have, to have played that role. So I think sometime in my early 20s, I had been a fan of other like naval history books. I'd read the C.S. Forrester books, and I was casting around. And I think I had a full start reading the O'Brien books because – as we're going to talk about, they're really heavy with kind of illusion and authentic detail. And even for a bit of a nerd, I found that the first reading was a bit of a turnoff. But at some point, I remember being on a long plane journey and I picked up Master and Commander and read it cover to cover and I was hooked. And that was that was back in the days of what you might call Pete O'Brien, back in the 1990s when the books were going absolute gangbusters and there was a huge fan base. And they, they kept on coming. You know, 20, 21, depending on how you count them, books. So I was... I was there at about that time. There's a very hardcore, a very, very well-established Patrick O'Brien readers and lovers who go back even further than that. But I've certainly been in them since before the movie, anyhow. For me, Ian, my story is pretty similar, which is my friend Dave Draffin handed me Master and Commander and said, these are the greatest historical novels ever written, and which, of course, is what the New York Times said about them. And I lo always loved historical novels, and I had the exact same experience. I made it through Master and Commander. It was hard. I didn't quite get it. I put it down. I didn't think I was going to do it again. And then about a year later, this is probably 93 or something yeah. or 94. I went, let me try that again. And I read it again. And suddenly I was like, how did I not see how amazing this book is? And then by the time I got to Post Captain, which is the second book, mm. I was 100% hooked and, and, and never went back. Um, John, let me ask you, how did you first come to this film? Well, I, I'll answer both questions, to be honest with you. I've never read the books, but I used to work in bookstores. I used mm. to manage oh, bookstores okay. and, uh, during the 90s. So um, when I was in the service, when I was getting out of the service, I would work uh, as assistant manager at night uh, with managing bookstores. And those Patrick O'Brien books, you're absolutely right. People, they were just lovers of those books they would show up they would buy them they'd have multiple editions yes. it, we, we couldn't keep those in stock they were always in one section and we were told to make sure that they were in order because people would complain about them not being in order and make sure they were faced out so that you could 
read yeah. which titles were what. And so you had you had your Sue Grafton fans, you had your John Grisham fans, <laughs> and you had your Patrick O'Brien fans. And they always – so I was always aware of those books. I just never read the books. But when I saw this movie, I remember that I saw the trailer, and I was very excited because Peter Weir – always directs a great movie on the water. Mm. And I and I was like, well, this is so interesting, a timepiece. Uh, Russell Crowe is at the height of Russell Crowe in his early yeah. 2000s. And Paul Bettany out of Knight's Tale, I'm, I'm fall, you know, really enjoying him in a beautiful mind as well. So I'm like, okay, let's see what this pairing feels like. And the trailer had so much scope to it that I just remember being like, I've got to go see this. And so I don't remember if I saw it with with uh, with some of my friends, or I saw it on my own, but I remember going to see the movie opening weekend because I wanted to savor and enjoy this film, and I've seen it multiple times since. It is an experience. You can't be on your phone. You can't be you know messing around the internet on your computer. Mm-hmm. You have to really sit back and and give t- give yourself to the film because yeah. the film will not come to you. You have to come to this movie and be part of the crew and live and breathe. Through it, and as I watch it now, Steve and uh, uh, everyone else here, I I just think of Star Trek so much more yeah. than ever, and especially watching Wrath of Khan again about a two three days ago before I watched this movie again for our show, I was like, this is all so similar. The Mutara Nebula is the fog, and you know yes. where is he coming from? Two dimensional thinking. It's so similar, and obviously there's something inside of me that enjoys um, uh, ship stuff, enjoys stuff on the water uh, and the ingenuity and the brilliance and the tactical brilliance Mm. of things like this. So the film really captures that. It is so crazy that you mentioned Star Trek because Mm. what I didn't say is the actual (laughs) reason that I reached out to Ian and Mike is I'd listened to their first few episodes Mm. and more than once in talking about Jack and Steven, Ian and Mike mentioned Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. And I had been having the same thought, True. which is that there's like a connection. Yes. I don't know that Patrick O'Brien ever watched Star Trek, but there seemed like a connection. And I had just started the, uh, the Star Trek show. Mm. So that's why I emailed them because it just was like brought these two loves together. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I will say one, one thing, and it relates to that Kirk, Spock, and McCoy thing. I have come to believe that the characters of Jack and Steven in the books is I believe the greatest friendship in the history of literature. Yes. I, yeah. I can't Amen. think, you know, like there's there's right. Ron, Hermione, and Harry, there's Sherlock Holmes and Watson, there's mm. the women and little women, there's there are a lot of good friendships, but I can't think of any that is so so much a marriage. And it really Kirk Spock and McCoy is one that's very similar of like mm. these are the most important relationships in these guys' lives. Um uh Mike, how did you first come to the film? Well, the film it, it was kind of having fallen in love with the books, I think I, I was easier to the books than you guys. Cause you know, my particular friend Ian Bradley recommended them. And I, you know, I'm one of those guys is, you know, as a general management consultant that says, you know, you never worry about the details. So I didn't understand any of the naval terms. I didn't understand any of the period, you know, period stuff. I didn't understand any of the arcane references. So I just blew by them and said, God, this friendship, like you were just saying, see, this friendship is so great. And I thought, how do you translate these books to a movie? I just, I can't imagine how you do that. How can you get the feel that we have had growing up over, you know, 20 novels into this one piece? And I I happen to be a a James Lee Burke uh, fan as well. Loved his novels, particularly loved uh, in the in the Electric Mist with Confederate Dead. That was the first mm-hmm. one I picked up of his. Mm-hmm. And then I said, well. yeah, they're, they're going to make a movie. And it was horrible, I thought. <laughs> and no, I just thought, no, like it. it's no wonder nobody's done any more of these books. Not horrible. I mean, it was fascinating in its own way, but it just wasn't the book. And, and I, I came sort of late to Master and Commander with great trepidation for that same thing. I didn't want to go through this again. <laughs> How about you, Ian? Uh, I came to the movie because it like I, I saw it coming in trailers and in promo like six months off and I was like I've got to be there I don't think I was there pr- premiere day but I was there in the in the opening week and dragged my wife along who's never remotely read a word of the Patrick O'Brien stuff and even she liked the movie. By the way, I, I, what a different movie it would have been with Tommy Lee Jones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I think so. Uh, um, for me, uh, I saw it opening night uh, with our good friend uh, Soren Oliver, who also mm. adores the books. It was in the Cinerama Dome in L.A., and I was just 
amazed at how much of the books they capture in the film. And that night I lost my favorite leather jacket. That's the no. other memorable event. No. Yes. <laughs> Maybe left it at the movie theater. I went back. They didn't have it. It was like, you know, when you find the right leather jacket, like that wow. is just right. A, it's part it's of a you. very valuable thing. There's, so there's somebody uh, somewhere who's going, well, I saw this movie and it kind of sucked. I don't want to write Russell Crowe, but I got this really cool leather jacket for movie. <laughs> yeah. I don't need to sit behind me. I'm curious if you could, in a very brief way, explain who's this Patrick O'Brien guy and how did these books come about? How did they become what they became? Patrick O'Brien was a relatively unknown, already quite old novelist and biographer back in the 1960s. C.S. Forrester had died. And I can't remember whether a publisher reached out to him or he reached yes. out to an agent, but there was a conversation where they said, well, you could try writing you know, naval history. And he was already this kind of scholarly, philosophical, hermit, polymath guy living in the south of France mm -hmm. in this very strange, very isolated existence, deep into Jane Austen, deep into Regency history anyway. And he just, I think he just started writing. And Master and Commander kind of stood alone as a little bit of a series pilot. We're talking 1968. 69 and they got great some great critical notice not fantastic but really good critical notice from a couple of great critics and he just started writing and they became his main um income he stepped away from the series for a while in the mid 70s to write a biography of picasso but i think at, at around about that time he decided he was going to map out the arc so i think right. he had the arc of the first half a dozen books laid out and i'm mentioning that just because as, as we're going to get into it we're going to see that the plot of the movie is a very interesting, very strange in some ways, synthesis of Master and Commander, the titular first novel, and also Far Side of the World, the other titular novel, and also a compound of at least three, maybe four, five, six of the other books, if you take in every little snippet of dialogue and every little set piece. So they, you, you can almost see how it's possible because the books themselves don't adhere to a very strict kind of novelish story structure. Yeah, they've been right. called this kind of big, kind of flowing novel all the way through the 20 books. He's almost arbitrary about where the books begin and end in terms of the story. So you've got loads to pick from. But on the other hand, super, super difficult to turn into a movie because so much is in the, um, the descriptive language and the narrative and the character and the structure and what's unsaid and all these layers of illusion. Just an absolute tour de force. So it raises the interesting question. How did somebody get to thinking about producing these movies there's a secondary question how did patrick o'brien get to agree to the production of the movies because he was absolutely not the kind of guy who'd go looking for movie options for books that would not have been his thing i don't think well in these books they were they were in relative obscurity i mean there were people that right. enjoyed them but these were not big hits for a really really long time no, i mean what, 90s, what is yeah. it that turned things turned things around for the books uh, a, a series of critical notice. He got a couple of very influential reviewers who got behind him. And then a British, sorry, then a US publisher, Norton, right. pick, mm. picked them up in the late 80s. And then he got some big celebrity readers. He got Charlton Heston kind of oh, popping oh, the books. Oh. <laughs> all, and uh, people in the British establishment, cabinet ministers, all kinds of people picked up on them. And he became the kind of darling of the literary classes for a while. And there were Patrick O'Brien societies and people would go to dinner aboard battleships and eat, you know, rats and lobscouse and hear readings. And it's a, it was a very strange story. In some ways, it's hard to know exactly the truth because his, he didn't write any kind of autobiographical material at all. The biographies that we do have Patrick O'Brien are a bit partial and disagree to some extent. So he's this very enigmatic figure. But the books and the public reception of them really blossomed. So by the time you got to the 90s, the mid-90s, we were in peak O'Brien, and there must have been this really narrow window because he died in 2000, 2000, and not very many, a small number of years after the books came out. So there was this really narrow window when he might have been receptive to a to an approach for writing a movie, and Peter Weir and the production team were around willing to put the time and the talent and the, the resources into it, and the fan base still being there for these books as well. It, it's, it's a real story of chance i think that all these things came together and I, I i can't imagine a similar story happening again very often with a set of books like this i had read that i think it was norton was doing one of these things in the american book tour and i guess he's up in boston or somewhere and somebody had brought the rose in 
and put it there, perhaps Norton to sort of, you know, to go along with this big book signing and thing. And, the Rose being oh, a, a ship that's a replica of that, of that era. Mm. Yes, thank you, Steve. Exactly. And and O'Brien supposedly had a conversation with the person who was, you know, owned the Rose or managed the Rose or something and said kind of, you know, with a little bit of paint and a few touches, that could be the surprise. And the guy, I guess, did some of that. And that was what turned Brian's thinking around. When he saw the surprise, he went, wait a minute. You know, maybe we could do a movie. And and then that, you know, it's kind of the talks began. It starts in, in terms of this production with a Fox executive, Tom Rothman, and he is obsessed with these books and really wants to make them happen. Right. So Tom Rothman had kind of come late in life to these books, found them by accident, is, is gone to visit uh, Old Lyme, Connecticut. And it's, he said, a British weather weekend. It's all rain. He's got nothing to do. He's bored. He's at his father-in-law's. And he stumbles across this book, Master and Commander, in his library and reads it in the rain. And, and that's kind of the beginning of the magic. And he calls up Peter Weir and he says to Weir, he says, look, I'm not going to pitch you a story. I'm going to give you a gift. And he gives <laughs> Peter Weir a sword. And Weir Ooh. looks at the sword and goes... O'Brien. And the guy says, yes. And of course, Peter Weir loved these books. And <sighs> he said, he said, no way. You can't do it. I've, I've already turned this down a couple of times. You can't make it. There's no way to make this film. It's just, you can't capture these books. And Rothman says, listen, here, I want you to think about it. It's always good when the <laughs> executive says, I want you to think about it. Do a little research, travel around England, look at some of the historical stuff, look at the rows and we'll see what you think. And of course, as soon as he started doing that research, he just got hooked. And the first thing that he said was, okay, if I do it, I am not going to start at the beginning. There's no way because you just because you can't get to the stuff that I want to get to if you start at the beginning. And so he said, I want to start in the middle. So here's his approach to writing this script is really, really interesting because what he basically said was, this is a one 5,000 page book. And so he read through the whole book again. And every time he saw something that he thought was interesting, he would photocopy it and color code it. And so what he did was he said, all the interesting dialogue, any dialogue that I like, photocopy that and put it in the dialogue folder. And so now there's a binder being built of dialogue. Anything about ship life, photocopy that, this is the ship life folder. Anything about sailing, photocopy that, that's in the sailing folder. Anything about natural philosophy and the Stephen stuff, that goes in that folder. And so what he did was he built up all of these stacks of all of the interesting things that he found in, in the book. And that, all of this research, all of these little cards and pieces that's what became the basis of the script. And the, the next thing he decided was he said, I want to shoot the entire movie at sea. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and, and, and he said, and so he starts watching Jaws and studying John Huston's Moby Dick to go like, these are guys that try to shoot stuff at sea. And very quickly, the studio <laughs> and even Weir said, okay, that's going to be impossible. <laughs> we, we cannot shoot it at sea. And so what they did was it's basically 100 days on land is this shoot and 10 days at sea. He called up Rothman when he finally agreed to do the movie and said, listen, I'll do it if you buy the rose. And so mm -hmm. and the studio went, okay, and they bought that ship. And wow. that's really the only real sailing ship they have is the rose. Everything else is either a ship a second ship that they built exactly right. the same exactly to scale in baja california that's in a big tank on a big gimbal <laughs> and then there's a model and then there's cgi so anytime you see two ships they never had two ships nope. because they couldn't build them and then the big thing of course in order to finally get all the financing is you got to get a movie star and they go after russell crowe he loves peter weir i mean russell crowe mm -hmm. was born in new zealand where he lived much of his life in Australia, Peter Weir, the great Australian director. And he said, I absolutely want to work with Peter Weir. This sounds great. He got a copy of the script. He read the script, didn't like the script, said no. Then they wrote another version of the script, sent him the script, and he looked at it and went, no. And he kept walking away. <laughs> then they gave him the books. He read the books, and then he said yes. Wow. The moment that all the, the blocks were sliding into place, 
the historical aspects of the production were being put together. And we were really fortunate to get a, a whole episode chatting to a guy called Gordon Laco. And Gordon Laco is the lead historical consultant on this movie and on a bunch of other movies like Greyhound and lots of other movies with naval oh, and military history in them. I love that movie. And uh, his day job, if you like, is running a company providing rigging and fitting out services for people operating period sailing ships. And he got faxed a rigging diagram and basically a blank right. check from the guy who operated the rows. And he's like, hang on a second, this is a complete refit for this sailing ship. And this guy is not exactly famous for having loads of resources to splash the cash. And he kind of, he said, he turned it over in his mind. He called the guy back and said, who's making a Patrick O'Brien movie? <laughs> <laughs> and the guy was like, you can't tell anybody. You can't tell anybody. But he had it figured out. Would you like to get into the film? Sure. Yes. We start as many historical movies start with some text on screen explaining that it's April 1805. Napoleon is master of Europe. Only the British fleet uh, stands before him. The oceans are now battlefields. And then we get this gorgeous top-down shot of the sea at night. And we see the ship coming into frame. And I remember being in the theater and just having this moment of like, oh my God, they really did do it. They did it, you know, because it looks, it's so gorgeous the way this thing is filmed. Yeah. We see a big wide shot of the ship at sea and we, and we see more text that this is the HMS Surprise. It's a 28 gun ship, 197 souls. It's off the coast of Brazil. And that the ship has orders to hunt down the French privateer Acheron, sink burn or take her a prize mm -hmm. and everything we're going to see they put so much time and effort into making everything perfectly accurate every rope is in the right place and everything that they built as we move into the ship and we see the sails well all the sails were correct for the period we see the lanterns and the hammocks swinging and we move through the uh, below decks and all of this is built to scale based on plans that they found that would have been the kind of ship that the surprise was. And I was thinking about it as like the last Russell Crowe movie we did, John is mm -hmm. gladiator. Yeah. Right. And gladiator. Gladiator is like the opposite. It's a right. historical movie where Ridley Scott went, well, I'm just going to make some stuff up, Yeah, you know, because that was what he wanted to do. That was entertaining. And I'm this gonna, is, everything's got to be right. I'm going to kill an emperor that uh, actually lived a pretty long life. Uh, I'm going to have him killed in the arena <laughs> and it never really happened. Um, You're going to have yeah, a bunch of guys yeah. in togas. That'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd be fine. But uh, this is what I appreciated about the movie is there's such an authenticity from the beginning. Even the font that they use right. puts you in the world of the movie. Like, and it's so important. And they're, again, they're not going to make the film come to you. You are going to have to do the work here. The way they start out, you know, most studio executives are like, you're starting out in the night and the dark and the water's black. Right. And what are you doing? No one's excited about this. But the way they're doing is they're showing you this is going to be a film that is going to take its time. It's a patient film. You're going to have to sit back, relax, and enjoy the process and trust that it's going to take you in a good place. And I, I just remember feeling that way that there was a, a confidence in that beginning. And uh, you like to see that in a filmmaker. And Peter Weir doesn't get anywhere near the love that he deserves for the amount of great films that he's made uh, over the years. And this is one of those that is just that it's just a, I think maybe this is the peak of Peter Weir as a filmmaker. You could argue mm. this is his greatest film ever. And there's just something about all of his talent coming together in this film. And the beginning kind of puts you in that place, the fog, even the way, and I don't know if we've gotten to it yet, but even the way everybody's introduced, like all of a sudden we have Paul Bettany, all of a sudden we have Russell Crowe. There is no big introduction. In fact, Russell Crowe is seen and then immediately his back turns to the camera. So so it's so great how he's saying to you, you're aboard the ship, but the ship isn't going to kiss your ass. You've got to come and you've got to understand where you rank on this in this situation. I love that. I, I think that's so exactly right, John, is he just mm. kind of puts you like here. We're in this world. Yeah. And, and look yeah. at it. Catch look up. At it. Yeah. Catch up. Yeah. Part of what he's doing is he wants to show the details. And one of the things that uh, Peter Weir said is he said that he thought O'Brien's great strength was his prose. And I love this sentence. He says, when you adapt a book, you pick it up and all the words fall out. <laughs> and you are left with just the skeleton and the characters. And then what he said is, is the challenge is to replace all of that beautiful prose with images that can equal them. Yeah. And that is what we're seeing, is you're seeing the images of the ship. And so without all of O'Brien's incredibly detailed description, you are still getting to know what this world is and being immersed in it. By the way, as we see guys walking around below decks, one of the things I think is really funny, they built all this to spec. 
So mm. the height of the decks is exactly what they would right. have been in this era. Humans are about five or six inches taller average <laughs> than humans of that era. So everything is even, it was already cramped for Jack, it's, you know, to walk around in this space. And now it's really, really cramped. Cramped. And like you say, we're not getting introduced front and center to the characters of the captain and the surgeon, Jack Aubrey and Stephen Maturin. We're actually getting acquainted with the ship and all of the people mm. aboard. We get the crew, we get the guns that have their names written on them. And I, maybe this is nerdy. I think we're being set up to see that the boat and the crew are kind of like a character. Mm. And I think we're being invited to kind of sympathize a little bit with this character because this character is going to have some relationships with Jack, especially all of the major players in this kind of ensemble cast get some screen time in the first three or four minutes. Yeah. If you look back, I, at it, you actually realize that they've all been there. We've seen uh, Pulling's the first lieutenant. We've seen Killick. We've seen the bosun. We've seen the master. We've seen all of these other characters and we haven't had to get to know them or hear dialogue mm -hmm. from them yet. But this first moment, it's just like you would landed in the middle of a family. It's like being at the breakfast table in a really chaotic family on a regular weekday morning. You think, <laughs> what the heck is going on here? Well, and speaking of the breakfast table, it is morning and we see getting some eggs from the chicken. We see uh, Bondin, which is Billy Boyd. He's the, the, the coxswain who is really good at the movie. He is completely not who I picture as Bondin uh -uh. at <laughs> all, not even remotely. But I like Billy Boyd a lot. This is not a criticism of him. We see men climbing up in the rigging. By the way, 27 right. miles of rope. Wow. Is what they had right. to, wow. to, to rig this ship. 27 miles. 27 miles of rope and the crew having, the crew, the extras, the stars having just spent five weeks of boot camp learning everything about it, learning to run up and down it barefoot. I mean, they're, they're great interviews with a lot of these folks talking about they had to do, not only was the ship to spec, the crew and the cast had to adapt to that, uh, including gunnery, including everything. A lot of head injuries early on. What is it, Slade? From an art summit. Sounded like a bell. And we have Hollum. Lieutenant Hollum is, he's got the watch. Native fisherman, perhaps. And we may or may not have seen something in trying to decide what we should do. Mr. Color me the lead, if you please. We're looking out into the fog and don't see anything. And we hear the leadsman calling out what the bottom is like. Sound and broken shell. Sound and broken shell. And a midshipman who's Mr. Calamy comes up. Should we beat the quarters? And this is a lower rank person trying to give a hint to the person that outranks him. Like, hey, and how, but Hollum is indecisive. That's what we're going to see over and over and over again. Right. And finally, the decision is made to beat the quarters, which means they bang a drum, everyone gets up. <laughs> we see for the first time, we see Stephen Matcher and Paul Bettany. Yeah. Uh, but as you said, John, we don't put anything on him. We just nope. kind of go buy it. Mm -hmm. uh, Russell Crowe, Jack Aubrey puts on his sword and he goes out on deck and Hollum says, maybe I saw something. It's kind of out there. You did the right thing, Mr. Hollum. Go to your stations. One of the things I love most about this film is the quiet. Yeah. And, mm. and I think because we're so used to motors and sound mm. that when there's ah. movement, there's got to be a machine. And where this, you're sailing in the middle of nowhere and it's quiet. Yeah, and can I, I want to say something here in this moment. This is a great character moment because if you're going to choose to introduce these characters, these famous actors at the time, you know, Paul Bettany was pretty famous at the time of becoming famous, you've normally you make a big deal of introducing them. So if you're going to decide yeah. to make it matter of fact or happenstance that they're there, then you've got to throw a little subtle character work. And there's a great moment where Russell, as the captain, Jack Aubrey, he is looking at the guy. The guy can't seem to tell him yes or no is his subordinate, whether he says, I th think I saw something. Blah, blah, blah. So he's just like, OK, all right, maybe this is not real. But then he pauses after everyone's left his side. He pauses for a moment as if he either smells or hears wood creeping yes, in the water. Yes. And that's a great character moment because in that moment as the audience, you go, oh, this guy's otherworldly. This guy's got ESP as a captain. This is why he's a captain. This is what the fact that he can sense something, even though he doesn't see it. It's his instincts. Right. And this is what makes a great captain. Kirk has those all through Star Trek moments, you know, so you when you have that moment, you're just like immediately you're like, OK, I'm cool with this. This is awesome. You know, and, and Russell plays it so subtly, yet so powerfully. It's great. I'm continually amazed at how great an actor Russell Crowe oh, yeah. 
Yeah. And, and it's so, cause he's this weird thing of like what he looks like, mm. particularly in this era is just this masculine action hero mm-hmm. type guy. And yet you see him, you know, in this decade play roles that are all over the place. Mm-hmm. And there's so much, as you say, John, there's so much subtlety in this performance. He's always subverting the expectation yeah. of yes. the size. Like yes. even in yes. LA Confidential, right? He's yeah. he's a dumb brute, but he's also sensitive. And you got you don't expect that. And Gladiator, the same thing, right? He's this massive guy, but they put him through hell. Yet in this moments, he's able to figure out and then you know has the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, even beautiful mind, a guy this size oh, having, geez. you know, ha- yeah. going through the things he's going through, you don't expect it. So you're right, Steve. This is Russell Crowe at his finest as an actor, but he's he's always good. He's always bringing you something, except when he sings. But he's, other than that, he's great. <laughs> <laughs> say and, that. And, and he's peering out into the fog, and then there is suddenly a flash of light. Down! All hands down! And I think this is the other reason that we start off so slowly and silently and just in the mood of this place, because now suddenly we're in the midst of battle, and mm-hmm. it is terrifying and again we've never seen a battle like this right cannonballs coming in the woods splintering the the chaos the vulnerability the people getting wounded and it comes just entirely entirely out of nowhere we were just saying before that uh russell crowe's really great at parts where expectations get undercut and Mm -hmm. i think that means o'brien is really great material for Russell Crowe because O'Brien's a master of like the undercut and the anticlimax and the kind of sleight of hand of taking your expectation and into a different place. Mm. But this is not a battle like we would have expected. You would have thought that there might be kind of, you know, drums and trumpets and Russell Crowe kind of raises his sword and goes rah, rah, rah. But his first order is everybody get down. The first thing that we have to do is not run out the guns and fire at the pesky French. We have to take damage. We have to just watch as the ship is and the people take these terrible injuries and blows from this ship that's out in the fog. It's not like a battle scene of any kind that you've seen any place else. Okay. I, I know we've already made a bunch of Star Trek references, but you know, it just occurred to me that this you is... You can't go straight to Kobayashi Maru. That's not allowed. I'm sorry. No, no. no. <laughs> it's, but it is, apple. But it, it's Wrath of Khan. It's Kirk yeah. with his shields oh, down right, getting right. hit by the Reliant. Yeah. Because yeah, uh, it, it's this totally unexpected... Right. He's caught with his britches down, which is what Kirk says. Yeah. Um, and what we find out is that this is a much bigger, much heavier ship. It's got bigger guns, yes. thicker sides. But Jack is never panicked. Right. Mr. Allen, come up on the wind. On the wind, sir. Lay me alongside a pistol shot. And, and I love, too, by the way, that Jack puts on his hat. Because, hmm. and this is something that's throughout the books, is that it, sometimes when you go into battle, you put on your best clothes. It, unless Killick <laughs> makes you do otherwise. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And then we see, which, which I love this details, we see tattooed on someone's hands, hold yes. fast. Yeah. And this is the character of Joe Place. Yeah. We see Killick, who's the Captain Stewart. And I think he, as much as I don't think Billy Boyd is well cast as Bondin, Killick is perfect. Oh, he's brilliant. Great. Steve, you mentioned the hold fast with Joe Place. And, and I was fascinated by... You know, you have all these things one after another after another here. Jack has just walked by this young midshipman, Williamson, who is crouched on the quarter deck. You know, he's scared. Mm-hmm. And Jack picks him up, you know, kind of lifts this midshipman up and says, We, you know, we always stand tall on the quarter deck. And Jack walks on, doesn't make a big deal of it. And Place is showing his tattooed fingers to Williamson, the midshipman. So it was just an amazing thing. Here's this lower class crew member, you know, taking this young midshipman, the young gentleman who really, you know, it's kind of this great meritocracy of the Navy, but for these midshipmen who are kind of often young gentlemen. But this guy plays is saying, no, I'm I'm here for you. And kind of an amazing Patrick O'Brien-like moment that's so quick in this action, you could miss it. I do want to say one thing about the hold fast thing. It's a nautical term that has the origins in the Dutch, oh. um, which is hood vast. That's what right. it means. Um, and it was uh, it was in regards to holding securely to ship ropes and rigging. And uh, apparently this was passed on throughout in the nautical ter- in the nautical times, like when from country to country, this 
this was told. And so people did this on their hands. People had these tattoos done on their hands yes. who were lifers on ships. And I don't know if that's in the Patrick O'Brien novels. As I don't I think so. No, that, but no. That, so yeah. that moment well, when it a- happened, I remember looking it up when I was watching it earlier today. I was like, oh, wow. Also, this intersection with superstition, Holdfast appears fairly early in the book of Deuteronomy. You know, this big kind oh. of, you know, you know, black and white. And, you know, if you want God to save you, Israelites, you're going to have to hold fast. And if you oh. don't, it might be your ass, wow. essentially. And and here's Joe Place with this hold fast, an old, old sailor, man of warsman, but also the guy who becomes kind of the prophet throughout this movie. I was like, oh, wow. it's, it's a really clever link. It's a really way of restoring the 5,000 words that dropped out of the book because <laughs> superstition and yeah. naval customer right. all the way through the books. Yeah. There's yeah. a really almost kind of metaphysical thing about superstitions, the superstitions that the upper class officers have and the superstitions that the crew have. We're going to get yeah. loads more of these superstition kind of beats in the movie as we go along. Right. And this is the first one. Nowhere in any of the books does anybody have a hold fast tattoo on their really? knuckles, but it was for sure exactly oh. an unauthentic wow. naval thing to do. And it just raises the point that seamen hang on to traditions and customs and they pass them along and he's trying to share them with the young kid. Yeah. And by the way, this is also a first glimpse into the theme of you know young people, children at war in the Navy, yeah. which is a big yeah. thing for O'Brien as well. It's another thing that right. they've put into the movie that very, very cleverly weaves in something that O'Brien cares about and writes about really brilliantly. Which, which well, is just, when you think about it today, it's so bizarre. Like yeah. we're going to spend a 10, 11, 12 year old kid out for a year or two you, through the mm-hmm. most difficult conditions to go fight in battles. That's just <laughs> crazy. And these kids haven't been, they haven't been enslaved and they haven't had to be given magical powers and they haven't had any great revelatory moment. It was just what you did. Kids mm-hmm. of certain kinds of families sent their kids, their boys away to sea at 8, 10, 11. It was like, not a special thing. You saw some of those really young ones too. And in those yeah. days, you kind of thought, oh my God, I can't imagine what would you have them doing on the ship? If they weren't on the ship, they were likely orphans in, yeah. in a much worse life. Oh, really? And so here they are, these little powder monkeys, these little kids, you know, 10 years oh. old, sometimes younger. The cast talks about that. The youngsters in the cast, they said, you know, everybody apparently was given all these documents about the times. And they said, you know, we found we were like the kids of that time because we were working, working really hard to make the movie, but we also found ourselves spontaneously playing. And we also played at the games that they played at while we were on this replica of the ship. You know what's so interesting to me about this conversation is that we just spent 10 minutes on, you know, eight letters or something. <laughs> right, right. And, and, right. But what's so interesting about it is that that's what Patrick O'Brien is, is that when you read those books, like you read the book through the first time, you're like, oh, this was this cool story about these guys. We went on this adventure. And then when you read it through the second time, you go, oh, wait, this line is referencing something that's going to happen two books from now. Mm -hmm. You know, that there's all these tiny details that is impossible to see, plus all of these literary and historical and philosophical references that are going on that where you kind of, and I've listened to you guys wrestle with this on the podcast of like, was Patrick O'Brien doing that on purpose to like make me think about this thing or am I making this up? Am I just adding to it? But it's that kind of (laughs) thing. And we get our next glimpse of Stephen. And one of the things about these battles is they are brutal. And Stephen is the ship surgeon is just standing in blood, so much blood that he asked them to throw sand on the ground because he's slipping in it. Here's just what's, what, what I find really funny is the prop guys, of course, you got to get some fake blood. And the prop guys go, you know what? Peter Weir's never used a lot of blood. We don't need a lot of blood. So they bought four gallons for the oh, whole movie. <laughs> they used three gallons in one day. Wow. That's, that's how much blood is in this film. Wow. <laughs> And now we see the ships firing broadside to broadside. And again, there's only one ship. All of this is done with composites. And there's so much special effects here. And like, for instance, when the cannons hit the ships and you see all those splinters going everywhere, is what they did is they'd have a live squib and then they'd add extra debris in the air, extra, they'd add the fog, they'd add all this stuff. And so they're continually plussing the images to make them feel more visceral, more realistic. And we see a kid with a splinter wound in his arm. This is our first glimpse of Love Lord Blakeney, which is played by Max Perkis. And he becomes a really, really important uh, character. And then Jack gets hit. And I love that the sound goes subjective. 
just yeah. for a moment. The rigging in the ears thing, it's great. It's a great combination of the way it's shot, the sound, and Russell Crowe's performance. Of You see him pull it back together and go back to being the captain. And what we hear is that they've shot the rudder away. And that is really, really, really bad. Yeah. Uh, and we see men at the chain pumps, which is they're pumping water out of the ship, which again, yes. is, you know, there's so many things that is like, well, that's something that happens all the time in Patrick O'Brien. Yeah. And then we put some boats over the side because we're going to try to pull the ship into a fog bank. And, and can you imagine like you're under fire, someone's shooting cannons at you. You got to go down in a ship and row with all your strength, just trying to get this big ship yeah. hidden in the fog. There's a very slight inconsistency here, which is that the Acheron appears to have wind in her sails and is tooling along quite nicely. And the surprise is in a flat calm, which is why they need to pull into the fog bank. But, you know. It must be so hard to keep track of all that. Oh, yeah. When you're making a film. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. I thought there was another Patrick O'Brien moment right in the midst of this too, because right before Jack gets hit, right before he finds out the rudder's shut away, he shot away and they're, they're fish in a barrel, as, as Alan says, he's just spotted the name of the enemy ship. Asheron, one of the rivers of hell, mm. which means river of woe or river of pain. So you see this through the telescope and then bam, every card that's dealt to you right after that is all pain and woe. Oh, Lucky Jack! Lucky Jack yeah. being his yes. nickname. Yes. And this is one of many things that I think mm. would never happen in the book, mm. is that people would not, no one called, the crew never called Lucky Jack, Lucky Jack where he could hear it to his face. No, that just would never, ever happen. That would never happen because there's so much, and this is what's hard. It's same with Mr. Allen saying we're shipping the, you know, we're fish in the barrel. Fish in the barrel. Is that right? Nobody would say these things because the books are so subtle and nobody, it's all very British and nobody's <laughs> expressing themselves. Mm. Clearly it's all formal and all internal. And this is how, but Peter Weir's got to get the information out, you know? Yeah. Yeah, he's got to make us understand it. And we don't have the advantage of Patrick O'Brien's prose. And we finally get into the fog and we have gotten away. Fog, brilliant choice because A, it, it lets us work the CGI compositing thing reasonably successfully. B, it does all of this kind of, the, it sets this kind of air of mystery. And also, by the way, you get this beautiful, beautiful light. I mean, I, I'm not a cinematographer, but everything about the ship to ship actions and all the kind of wide shots of the ships is just gorgeous it's got all these beautiful tones and it's lit like the crew looks so like they're in an oil painting interestingly one of the consultants on the movie is a guy called jeff hunt and jeff hunt was the oil painter who painted the most famous of the sets of cover art and i've got to wonder if there was something about having jeff hunt around that got them to the place where they can get this very painterly look it's not all the way through the movie but i think especially in the ship to ship actions and especially some of the shots of sky it looks like a turner painting well i know certainly that peter weir studied a bunch of paintings and had a bunch of paintings both from the period and other paintings as reference yeah and uh, while mm. I, I i'm very curious why they brought jeff hunt on on i'm also Peter Weir's got a ridiculously good eye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like it's it's not like he yeah, hasn't made yeah. absolutely stunning movies before yeah, this. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> so, what's the butcher's bill? Nine dead, twenty-seven wounded. I just want to point out at the beginning of this movie, we heard there are one hundred and ninety-seven people on this boat, which means five percent of them just got killed, mm. and thirty about one sixth of them are wounded. Right. You know those kinds of numbers are th that would be a disaster today. I mean that five percent killed you know, incident, we never hear anything like that. It would be an absolute, but that's what the reality was for these people. And Jack goes to talk to Lord Blakeney, who's being very brave about his broken arm. And then Stephen says, let me take a look at that brow. And suddenly Jack remembers that actually he got yeah. there. And by the way, speaking about the blood, for many, many minutes in the movie's timeline, many hours after the battle, everybody's still bloody. They sit down to dinner later on and they're all still wearing right. clothes with bloody cuffs and wounds. And they're, they're at sea in the early 19th century and they have salt water to wash in. Of course, they don't all have freshly laundered pressed linen. They're, they're messy and bloody and grimy, you know, for hours after the battle. It's a really, really nice touch and I can well understand. And now we get what is really our first piece of actual dialogue. Damn, it was good. It came out of nowhere. Hit us with a full broadside, cut across our tail and took out our rudder. We only slipped away because of the fog. Quite fortunate, really. You may have had the weather gauge, but we had the weather gods. Ah. Which is just to say they got really lucky. Right. And then Stephen says, I have no idea precisely what it is you're talking about, but he 
This seemed to come off rather well. <laughs> and we hear mention of maybe they had spies, which is a weird thing. And this is the first thing I'll bring up is that they bring up this thing about spies. It never has anything to do with anything else in the movie. Right. And I think the only reason it's there is because Stephen Matcher is, is a spy. That's part of what the stories of the books are. Spoiler alert for people who haven't read them, but that's he has this entire double life and he is as exciting and adventurous and brilliant as Jack in his own right as one of the great spies, you know, fighting against Napoleon. But that's just a part of his character that's just not in this movie. So here's the thing at, at that moment where Paul Batney says the French have their spies, as do we. I, I, I've got two reactions, and you can you can flip a coin and pick one of the reactions. Well, one one reaction is I am an O'Brien fan, and I know that Stephen Matron is a spy, and I know that they just planned that, that little thing there for me to have a little knowing smile, and I lean in and I go, yeah, Stephen Matron the spy. Oh, great work. That's that's reaction number one. Reaction number two is, are you fucking kidding me? This is the most badass, tortured soul. You know, um, Napoleon hating um, espionage master in the history of literature. This is the guy who defeated the Spanish treasure ships, got the French out of Mauritius, and bludgeoned two agents to death with a stone phallus in a Boston hotel room. And all he gets to say is, Ooh, we have some spies too. Like, and as a, as a fan of the books, like you said, I lose objectivity. <laughs> well, this is the thing about this movie as opposed to the books. The books is without question an equal partnership. Yeah. They are both stars. Yeah. And in yes. fact, you probably spend, I'm sure someone's measured it, you spend more time in Stephen's head than you do in Jack's. Oh, easily. Um, because he's right. the introspective right. intellectual one. So mm -hmm. he's the one who's always observing things. And this movie is has a, a movie star and the star of the film is Captain Jack. Mm -hmm. And Steven is a That's supporting right. character. Yeah. And this is what's hard for me. I think it's yeah. such a well-made movie. But I also am like, no! <laughs> it's just like you say, Ian. It's like right. Steven is the most um, remarkable character. And he, mostly he's not in this film. He's a shadow of himself. Well, but we do get a little nod to his brilliance here. He knew we were looking for him. He could have easily stood to see him pass well clear. Well, then perhaps he was looking for us. And this is a brilliant, I think, Matron insight, you know, that, that's very book worthy. And then we get into a discussion with the other officers about this ship that has clearly really, really thick holes because our shots wouldn't penetrate. It has an advantage in firepower. And as they're talking about, you know, like, well, he had the weather gauge. And Stephen asks, uh, what is that weather gauge thing? Which is, again... <laughs> Explaining <laughs> nautical terms to Stephen is something that happens over and over again in the book. And basically what it is, is if you have the weather gauge, the wind is to your advantage and you get to choose where the battle happens and how it happens. And if you don't, you're at the mercy of the other ship. Um, I like uh, that the guy yeah. serving them gives him a look like Jesus Christ. Yes. Yeah. How many times exactly. we got to explain this to you? I dig <laughs> right. that. I love, once again, there's little moments of right. hierarchy in the ship. And although yeah. you are ranked higher than me, I have more experience than you on the sea. It's just so interesting to see these interplays throughout that are subtle. Well, and this is of all the crew well, members, Killick is the one they nail. Yeah. He, yeah. He, his grumpy, right. grumbling, <laughs> in some slightly insubordinateness. <laughs> Uh, there's great things in the books where like, even though, you know, Jack and Steven, you know, Jack obviously outranks Killick by a million degrees, but they're both scared of him. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he bullies them into doing all sorts of things <laughs> they don't want to do. Even in this scene, Jack starts to describe it by writing it in ink on the tablecloth and Killick says, not on the cloth. And Jack, you know, pulls his pen back up. <laughs> And then we talk about, well, this is, you know, this is the modern kind of ship. This is the new sort of frigate that we're going right. to be fighting. And then Stephen, not realizing really who's hurry, <laughs> whose feelings he's going to hurt, says, By comparison, the surprise is a somewhat aged man of war. <laughs> That's like insulting Jack's wife. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he, right. Jack loves this ship the way that Kirk loves the Enterprise. Would you call me an aged man of war, Doctor? Surprise is not old. No one would call her old. She's a bluff bow, lovely lions. She's a fine seabird. Weatherly, stiff, and fast. Very fast if she's well handled. No, she's not old. She's in her prime. <laughs> what is the shot? Is that the shot of the, for lack of a better, the toilet or the bathroom? Is that the shot he's look, when he's looking 
at that thing that's all be, is shot up around through that mm, hole. Is it the head? I don't know. I think it's a busted gun port or something. I don't think oh, it's the captain's okay. head. We all do right. get a shot later on of the seamen's heads, which we'll talk about when we get there. Right. But, yeah. And then we get into this question. Mr. Lamb is confident with basic repairs. We can get home as we are. We're not going home. And they're, they're going, look, we need a port to refit. The Asheron is still looking for us. Sir, with respect, she's a vastly heavier ship. She's out of our class. And this is, again, something I don't think would ever happen in the books. Nobody questions Jack's no. orders like this. No. Maybe Stephen. <laughs> but even Stephen wouldn't... First of all, he would never speak on nautical terms because he doesn't know anything. Yeah, yeah. And, he, and he wouldn't right. be direct and he wouldn't do it publicly. No, absolutely not. And now we're back with Blakeney. Old Joe told me that when you die, they stitch you up in your hammock with the last stitch through your nose just to make sure you're not asleep. And of course, what we don't know, but we're about to find out, is that he's about to have his arm amputated. Yeah. And so he could very well be someone who is sewn up into his hammock. It's a lovely bit. I mean, to borrow your term, guys, it's a it's a it's a plant that has two or three payoffs. There's some payoffs that come later, and there's that payoff right there. It's setting us up to think, well, what's going to happen next? We see Blakeney being carried in to have his arm amputated, and he's like waxy pale. Yes. And for a moment, I remember the first time, is the kid dead? And it's a oh, really yeah, great right. little bit of showing, not telling. As as we kind of think, well, what's going to happen to Blakeney? Is he is he in danger of death? And then we see this terrible kind of gray face of his. And then we get into the, the the sequence of him having surgery, which is just really touching. It, it is. And Paul Bettany plays this so well, yeah. so gently. Yeah. And it's so brutal. You know, he's got some laudanum, which is like uh, an opiate, and that numbs the pain. But you can't knock anybody out. And so this kid has to sit there while his arm is sawed off. And, and by the way, Peter Weir resisted Paul Bettany because Paul Bettany had been in Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe. Mm. And he also felt that Stephen was the book's most fascinating character. And Paul Bettany was brought in, did a screen test, and Weir went, yeah, okay, this is the guy. I've never seen a braver patient. And now what we see is the repairs of the ship. And one thing we see as we're going through the repairs is one of the crewmen point out that Jack carved something into the mast when he was on the ship as a midshipman. He's known this ship man and boy. He says there's enough of his blood in the woodwork for the ship to almost be a relation. And that is certainly true in the books. Jack's connection to the surprise is a deep, deep, deep connection. And now one of the things we heard in the sick bay was that Joe Place, the guy with the hold fast tattoos on his hands, has a depressed fracture of his skull. And now we cut to a shot of the crew standing around in a circle in deep silence watching something their faces the faces of these crew is just remarkable and one of the things peter weir said is he said i want the whole world i want yeah. every single kind of face wow. and so the casting directors they went to like local bars they went yeah. they went to the military bases they went to factories and they ah. just were looking for faces that come from you know older younger craggy right. people that have lived life yeah. <laughs> weir said i want marines drunks thieves <laughs> that's who he wants this crew to be <laughs> um and he said and i love this line he said we should love them for their faults mm, that's great jesus that's great so his brains doctor no that's just dried blood those are his brains oh. And this is where we hear a little bit more about Stephen, that he's not just a ship surgeon, that he's actually a full physician, and that he'd charge you a lot of money to do this yeah. kind of thing if you're trying to do it on land. Apart from the fact that, by the way, from, from the O'Brien book nerd point of view, it's great. It's dead on point. This happened in the books. It's all based on primary research that O'Brien did. So this kind of trepanning would really have been a thing. So that's it mm. scores max points for the authenticity bit. I right. want to give a shout out for the sound. Um, same thing for the amputation scene. But when they, these surgeries, there's, an, there's another one coming later in the movie as well. And I, did they get nominated or did they, did they win the Oscar for best sound or best sound editing? You're right. They did. Yeah. And like the sound of the, the sound of the machine, the, the instrument cutting the bone in the skull and the kind of very slight kind of gristly, gloopy noises that they're doing the surgery. It's really cool. And it really puts you right there. And you're clearly fascinated. You know, you're part of the, this rogues gallery of crew members all kind of gazing on at this horrifying operation just taking place. In this scene too, they're talking, you know, you see Stephen as a great doctor, but we also hear Bondin talk about him as a naturalist for the first time. You know, Bondin says, you know, and he, he knows his birds and bees, you show him a beetle and he'll tell you what it's thinking. <laughs> One of the things that was difficult about this shoot is that 
if if we're on land, well, then you only have to call the enough cast members that you needed for that scene. But because we're out at sea and everybody is packed together on this ship, pretty much every single actor and wow. every single background person had to be there for every single day. And that meant massive amounts of hair, makeup, costumes, false teeth, all sorts of stuff that they had to do every single day of the shoot. We're below decks and in comes Jack to give Blakeney a book. And it's a book on Lord Nelson. It has all of his major battles in it and, and some very fine illustrations. Thank you, sir. Just as Stephen was so gentle during the amputation scene, Jack is so great in this scene. Did you ever meet Lord Nelson, sir? I had the honor and privilege of serving with him at the Nile, a great victory. You can find it in here, actually. And he even knows the page number. Page. 135, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> May I beg you to tell me what kind of man he is? You should read the book. Do you feel like that's a little bit of a Peter Weir homage to Patrick O'Brien? From mm. those who are going to watch this movie, tell me more about Jack Aubrey. Read the book. Yeah. Do you think that's a little <laughs> like kind of subtle? I, I like, love that idea. Love yeah. it. <laughs> I, th- I feel like it when it struck me this time, like, oh, this is a nice little moment. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I didn't want to miss the part where Blakeney flips to the front and sees the picture of Lord Nelson and realizes that he's missing his right arm like Blakeney is missing his right arm. I just think that's kind of the heart and soul of of O'Brien. It's 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 not a scene in the book, but God, it is so O'Brien and it is so Jack and it is so this relationship. Great catch. Yeah, that's nice a catch, really though. good catch. And now we're toasting some cheese, which is the one of the two things that Killick actually can cook well. Toasted <laughs> cheese, and he makes good coffee. Other than that, it's not it's not gourmet meals. Scrape, 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 scrape. Never a tune you could dance to. Because for the first time, we're going to hear Jack and Stephen play. How about this? <laughs> For a movie that's famous for its scoring and for the soundtrack, it's taken a lot of getting here. Like even into the battle, we had some like drum sounds and we had some more like sound effects than score. We haven't really been beaten over the head with score yet at all. And now, uh, it's 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 what's the right word? What's the term for music that's in the scene? Diegetic. It is uh, diegetic. Yes. Right. Good job. That's, that's <laughs> a know. fancy film term. <laughs> You know, I, I, I know where I'm at. I, I knew where I was coming. I had to bring some game. There you go. That's my, that's my one film term. And again, for the O'Brien nerds, we get a little inward smile because this is the moment. We know that the relationship between Jack and Stephen is expressed by the music. We know that the music is a big part of the books and the context for the books. And we really love the fact that our heroes are actually going to play. We didn't get to see Stephen actually spying. We haven't yet got to hear Jack Aubrey actually make a dad joke. But that's coming, but we're going to get to hear them play together. And that's just fantastic. So it sounds like Russell Crowe works hard on everything. You know, in, in Cinderella Man, he worked hard on his boxing. He worked hard on his sword fighting in Gladiator. He always works hard. He says learning to play the violin is the hardest thing he ever had to do for a movie. <laughs> wow. And he had two teachers, which is so bizarre to me. One of the guys that taught him is the guy who taught him the Appalachian accent for A Beautiful Mind taught it was one of his violin teachers and strangely enough there are actually three composers on this film and they all worked really well together there's iva davies christopher gordon and richard tugnetti richard was the first violin he's the real teacher for russell crowe he's the guy who recorded all the tracks that they're playing to in playback christopher gordon conducted the orchestra and iva davies liked being in the booth recording so they all sort of had their own jobs and handle different parts of this as we see Jack and Stephen mm. playing music. As a string player myself. Mm. That it's it's always hard watching people miming playing instruments when when you know that they're miming. They get so close. They do a really, really good job. There's an even better moment right at the end of the movie that we'll get to later. These are actors who've had some lessons and they've learned hard, but they're doing a really, really good job with the miming. You can see it in their faces. You can see it in the way that they get to kind of exchange little musical phrases back and forth. As a string player, I'm looking at that thinking, yeah, pretty fair job. Um, credit to Crow and to Bettany and to Tonietti and the other folks who coached him as well. It's really good stuff. You reminded me, I had I had one other thing I wanted to say about the music. It applies kind of maybe in the last scene where they're playing together, yeah. but I've never been able to say this publicly. 
I think that Jack and Steven are actually jazz musicians, but jazz hasn't been invented yet. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, because, wow. yes. Because what you hear throughout the books is that they improvise on themes, yep. that they take a little theme from a piece of music and they throw it back and forth and they play with it. And that's jazz. They're playing wow. jazz. They just know such thing as jazz yet. It's the except it's the 18th century version of classical music. Now, Johann Sebastian Bach was an improviser, and O'Brien worships Bach, and Aubrey and uh, Maturin worship Bach. We're going to hear one of the Bach cello suites. Bach was an 18th century jazz musician, or at least the closest you would ever get, because he mm. could improvise. He knew about chord structures. He knew about modes and scales, and the way that people played together. In certainly, certainly in the 18th century, getting less so in the Regency era, but certainly in the 18th century, people did tend to play to, get to yeah, people did tend to play together in this more kind of improvised way, and I think it's a really good connection. It's a, it's as good a connection as the connection to Star to Star Trek is the connection to these two guys are jazz musicians and they like to pass phrases and backwards and forwards. They have the musical language of the 18th century, not the musical language of Miles Davis, but I think it's a really really good m- metaphor for how the music plays a role in the conversations that they have. And it suits I think it suits Russell Crowe as well. I think he's he's a jazz musician kind of a kind of a guy. Another gorgeous shot of them sailing. I love the shot where Jack is sort of hanging onto a rope hanging off the side of the ship. And Russell Crowe says that he absolutely loved being out on the rose. So this is them, you know, those 10 days where they were out sailing. He said it just felt so real and free. And there were whales and dolphins that were following the ship. And it was absolutely fantastic, except for one day that they got blown a little bit too far west. And they had to... (laughs) to make their way back home through <laughs> seven foot high seas. And uh, it suddenly wasn't so much fun to be on the rose. It was a little yeah. tougher. <laughs> the crew enters to Jack's quarters with a model. It's the Acheron, sir. You see, Will here, he's seen her being built. In, in Boston, sir, during the peace. And Jack is grateful, gives them an extra ration of run, which is the biggest reward you can really get on the ship. This is Nagel and Warley because clearly, you know, this connection between the two of them, boom, they're the guys who are going to save the surprise, at least set them up to fight the Asheron on somewhat near fair terms. One of those little divergences between the book and the, and the movie is that in the book, The Far Side of the World, the, the ship they're chasing around the world is not a French frigate. She's an American frigate. And you can imagine maybe the political decision making in the studio at the time in the early 2000s about, are we going to let Brits chase Americans as the bad guys around the ocean? I don't think so. Let's fall back on the French. <laughs> of so course. What, what they've done is they've made the Acheron, by the way, was not a name ever used in any of the books, but never mind. It's a really nicely chosen name. The Acheron herself is the CG model is taken from the USS Constitution, who's still afloat in, in Boston Harbor. Wow. The USS Constitution was one of this generation of modern American frigates. So most of the attributes that they give her, like she's modern, she's heavy, heavy hulled, she's fast, she's strong, she's heavily gunned. Those are all true attributes of this modern generation of American frigates that in 1812 and thereabouts kick the ass of the British Navy, as it so happens, as 1812, as anybody will tell you if you go to visit USS Constitution in Boston. This is one of the ways that they're, that Peter Weir is pulling from all these different books, because the trepanning of Joe Place is actually in the first book, Master and Commander. The ship in Far Side of the World is uh, the Norfolk, but the Norfolk doesn't surprise the surprise. They're actually chasing it throughout the book, trying yeah. to catch it. And the, and the ship that actually in terms of what the battles are like is really more from desolation Island when they're fighting the Voxum height. And, uh, and that is chasing Jack, except they're not in the surprise for that. They're in the horrible old leopard. So that, so he's taking all of these little elements from different books and putting Mm -hmm. them together. I like what I think, Ian, it was you that said, O'Brien, it's not like he, he sits with real classical novel structure. They're always just sort of these events yeah. And, th- and one of the things that's so amazing and so frustrating about O'Brien is he basically almost never gives you what you want. Nah. You, you're, you always feel like I'm building up to this big confrontation, but mm-hmm. no, no, the mo- the book's going to go somewhere completely different. And you're like, oh, I guess that's not going to happen. Right. You know, it, it, it's always uh, surprising. And once again, in this scene with the offers, we have Alan arguing that we can't fight the ship. Yeah. There's no way he's out of our class. We shouldn't do it, which again, I would say would never happen in the books. But but what they're establishing in the movie, which I think is not fitting the characters of the book, is does this make sense? 
for the mm. surprise to be going after that ship. Why is Jack doing this? We're seeing some some native people in canoes and we're making trades and getting ready to head out. And there's just a very, very brief moment where Jack sort of makes eye contact with a girl. Uh, <laughs> and it's, of course, the only women we see in the, in this movie. And, you know, you're on a boat for a couple of years and mm -hmm. suddenly you see a pretty girl. Eh, it'll have an effect. I just love that as Jack has, has got this sort of moment of, of mental and emotional infidelity, in the background, we hear the bosun hollering at somebody else, put that woman down. You know, this is, this is you know, his majesty's navy, not a floating bordello. And Jack, with that in the background, sort of looks at her one last time and then walks <laughs> off. And I thought that was a, you know, a fabulous kind of juxtaposition of these two conversations in this little scene. Which kind of alludes to Jack's, you know, predisposition in this area in the books. Uh, let's have dinner, gentlemen. To wives and to sweethearts. Wives and sweethearts. May they never meet. <laughs> At these dinners, one of the things that happened a lot was there was a lot of drinking, and everybody is a bit soused. I think at this table, <laughs> just a little. Uh, and someone asks Jack again about Lord Nelson. Did you meet him, sir? And this is a story that's it's right out of the book. He leant across the table and looked me straight in the eye. And he said, Aubrey, may I trouble you for the salt? <laughs> <laughs> I've always tried to say it exactly <laughs> as he did. <laughs> I love the way Jack plays it because he's make, he, he knows it's a ridiculous thing to remember. The second time he told me a story about how someone offered him a boat cloak on a cold night. And he said, no, he didn't need it. His zeal for king and country kept him warm. And you see Stephen react to this. Oh, St Stephen's eye roll is great, isn't it? <laughs> I know it sounds absurd. I'm worried from another man. You'd cry out, oh, what pitiful stuff, and dismiss it as mere enthusiasm. But with Nelson, you felt your heart glow. Again, that's right out of the books. <laughs> And it, it's a great Russell Crowe moment as well. There, there's some moments when he's speaking the O'Brien dialogue, and I think I'd like it if he was a bit more kind of a bit more British and tripping and bouncy and lilting with the dialogue. But there are some moments where he just he really inhabits it, and it's a lovely moment. It's it's a bit of dialogue that has to sound like you're being sincerely insincere, if you know what I mean. Mm. And he's clearly pulling his right there with him. Stephen Matron rolls his eyes, but we're going to find out that he doesn't care for this kind of stuff anyway. But it's a real moment. You think this is a this is a, mm. the the role of Nelson as a hero is something that Jack really really wants to follow. He really wants to be like Nelson to the crew. Well, then he would seem to be the exception to the rule that authority corrupts. And we and we hear this line, which we which is quoted from Nelson all the time, which is, he said, "When in battle, never mind maneuvers. Always go straight at him." One thing I find very strange in the books is. Jack never goes straight at him. That he's a this brilliant tactician. Yeah. He even though we hear this quote that his hero said, Jack's all about maneuvers. Yeah. That is what he does. That's what makes him such a great captain. Do you see those two weevils, Doctor? I do. Which would you choose? This again, this is right out of the book. Yeah. It's word for word. Neither. There's not a scrap of difference between them. They're the same species of Kalkulio. <clears throat> if you had to choose if you were forced to make a choice if there was no other response well, then, if you're going to push me i would choose the right hand weevil it has significant advantage in both length and breadth jack hits the table and says there i have you you're completely dished do you not know that in the service one must always choose the lesser of two weevils <laughs> So ridiculous, so ridiculous. It's such a dad joke, isn't it? <laughs> what, what's so great, and this is one of the things I think Russell Crowe nails about Jack's character, is Jack has a silly su sense of humor, and when he laughs, he laughs with his whole, whole everything. Mm, he yeah. loves to laugh so much, and even people who don't think it's funny, like Stephen, can't help but love Jack when he's laughing. <laughs> We're on deck, and just as the officers are having their dinner and their entertainment down below, up on deck, the men are dancing and singing. Joe Place is standing there. He still hasn't spoken. And then he says, And the Lord taketh, and the Lord giveth away. 
And they go, doctor, he spoke. And then the men burst into a song. They start singing farewell and adieu to you fair Spanish ladies. Yeah. Which, of course, I can't not think of Quinn You're right, in Jaws. Jaws. Yeah, Quentin. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. I forgot about Quinn. Oh, that's a great spot. And he could have been in this movie if he did, if he stuck around, couldn't he? <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> he would. I'm trying to now. I'm trying to cast him. Robert I'm not Shaw. quite sure who he would be. And then a very strange thing happens. All the men are singing together, and then there's this other voice that comes in—a beautiful, soft voice. And the men stop singing, and we see that as Hollum, our indecisive lieutenant. We hope in a short time to see you again. It's a weird moment because it's his singing doesn't seem like it was welcome. It's a it's a really great moment for me of character for this guy Hollum. So not only is he a bit indecisive and a bit touchy about his status, he's he really doesn't know how he sits with the whole of the crew. So it's not just that one or two of the other officers think he's flaky. We get this chance for him to exhibit his flakiness. And um, by the way, I think Lee Ingleby's performance here is great, hmm. and I think the use of the song is really lovely. This moment of everybody's head kind of turns and it goes quiet. And even though he's a beautiful, mm. beautiful singer, he's just cast himself as the outsider. Mm. And O'Brien doesn't waste any moments like this. We know that Peter Weir doesn't waste moments like this. This is a plant that we're going to have to get paid off later on, I think. Absolutely. And of course, right as this moment, suddenly mm. there's a sale. Because the Phantom has found them again. And... They have the weather gauge, and so all the surprise can do is turn and run. We'll have to bend every sail. Put up our pocket handkerchiefs if we have to. Again, I don't think Alan would have said that to him at this moment. And one of the things I wish they had done, I wish they would had showed us a little bit more of Jack's genius as a sailor. I wish they had shown him putting, you know, light hawsers to the main mast or doing, you know, like like shortening this sail and changing that sail and getting the trim right. And those things that we hear a lot in the books, I think this would have been a moment where he could have done just a little bit of that. What is it with this man? I kill a relative of his in battle, perhaps? His boy, God forbid. Which is what had happened in Desolation Island when they're being chased, yeah. is he had killed the son of the captain, and that's why the captain keeps chasing them. Right. Which is also uh, a little bit, a, a bit of a parallel with the moment when Butch and Sundance are being chased. Oh, who are these guys? <laughs> who are <laughs> these guys? Yeah, good point. Oh, by the way, I, I really like the view through the telescope, partly because it's a nautical movie trope, right? It's the U-boat captain's view of, mm. of the ship, and we like that. But it's an 18th century U boat captain's view because it's through glass that's all kind of slightly wavy and there's mm. kind of color shifts and it's a bit hazy. I just love the fact that it feels like we're looking through Jack Aubrey's telescope. And there's got to be some reason why Jack feels so compelled to keep going with his voyage. We've got there's got to be some reason why this other captain, the captain of the Akron, is sticking with it because we're heading into, far into the Southern Ocean here. And I still don't think we found out. I still don't think we found out what's driving Jack yet. As they continue to sail, we see Jack teaching the midshipmen because that's part of the job is to teach them navigation. And Calamy, one of the midshipmen, says, what are they building? Because they've got some barrels and some stuff over the side. And Jack says, your first command. And now it's dusk. It's almost made it to nighttime. The Phantom has now started opening fire. And we see that this is a big raft that actually has its own mast and sails. And they put a rope around Calamy, put him out on this raft. And what we see is that they're creating a decoy. And just as it's getting dark and we turn all the lights off on the surprise, just as we turn exactly parallel lanterns on on this raft, and then they separate and they yank Calamy back with this rope to pull him back on board. It's a great bit of trickery. It's both authentic back to the books, but really more interestingly, it's authentic back to something that a real naval captain actually did. You know, Jack Aubrey was the uh, was sort of the alter ego of a guy called Thomas Cochrane. And he did exactly this thing in almost exactly the same situation. So it looks ridiculous. It looks far-fetched, but it was real. One of the things I loved here in a lot of the night action in this film is you can actually see what's going on. So thank God for the lighting in this movie. <laughs> We're below decks with the men. And we hear a little bit what a privateer is, which is basically a privateer is a pirate with a piece of paper from a government saying you could go out and attack the enemy and that's fine. Uh, and without that piece of paper, then you're just a pirate. And what that means is this ship probably is worth a lot of money because it's probably taken out a bunch of British whalers, which means if we take that ship, we get prize money because one of the big motivations for the Navy is if they take a ship, 
they get a lot of the money and the money even gets split down to every single crew member. Even the little kids get a little bit of money um, from taking a prize. I, I just thought nice. it was interesting in the midst of this discussion, it almost seems like there's there's a team Lucky Jack and a team Phantom that, you know, are sort of debating back and forth here about what's going on and what to do, you know, because part of the team Lucky Jack is, hey, there's this great prize. We're going to get her. We're going to have lots of money. And Nehemiah Slade says, It's all very well, now you Got to get home to spend it, but never met a dead man who bought me a drink. I thought, ooh, that's kind of like a Patrick O'Brien ominous line, you know, in this conversation between Slade and Nagel here. Well, and I love the next line, which is someone says, and I've never met a live one and you bought one for me. <laughs> <laughs> also, great Patrick O'Brien humor to follow right in on that, you know, tension builder. And of course, Jack doesn't want to just run away. He he wants to be in a position where he has the weather gauge and can attack the phantom. And we see a shot again. It's gorgeous. Jack is at the top of those masts, which seems absolutely terrifying to me. I mean, you're in a ship that's going side to side. The wind is pushing you. You're just on a little piece of wood way, way up in the air. It looks real scary. And of course, he's done it. The ship is right in front of them. Jack found it exactly where it's supposed to be. In all my years, I've never seen the like. It has to be more than a hundred sea miles and he brings us up on his tail. That seamanship, Mr. Pullings. My God, that seamanship. It feels to me, and you guys have read the books, and, and I just, it feels to me like you have to pull these kind of maneuvers to convince the, how would I say this, the lower ranked members of your crew that you are a captain worth following. What I've read and the little I've seen being out on the sea is a tough, tough experience, you know, and there's all, as you said, there's all kinds of superstitions. You know, you can look at this akin to battle, you know, having served in the military myself, there's all kinds of superstitions. There are coolers. There are people you think that are bad luck. There's all kinds of that stuff that comes up in conversations and it takes a life on its own. And we see this in the movie, but also your captain or your person in charge has to constantly prove to you in these little subtle ways or kind of really overt ways that they are somehow smarter than you, tactically more brilliant than you, more capable than you, so you can keep following them uh, because you're bred to be able to fight. You're bred to be able to handle the situation. And here on the sea, I'm sure these all, all these people uh, that are veterans, are I've seen it all. And so you've got to keep wowing them to keep their loyalty to you and so when Jack does this, it's a great little moment. He's like, ah, brilliant tactician. He's just like this kind of wonder that they they feel honored to serve with him as he did serving the captain in the Nile, you know? So it's that kind of situation. I'm so glad you brought this up because I think one of the great things about Patrick O'Brien mm. is that these books are just a manual of leadership. Mm. And Jack is such a great leader. And there's so much, and he, and you hear his thought process as in his explanation and his teaching other officers. And one of the things he talks about a lot is that the officers have to be competent. Yes. They, that, that a crew will not follow officers that they can't believe in. And they know that Jack can do it all mm -hmm. because he's shown it over and over again. Yeah. And the other thing that's interesting, I wasn't sure when to bring this up. So, uh, Mike, you mentioned how much training everyone went through. Well, one of the things they did in the training is that they all had T-shirts of different colors, and those T-shirts were those were their ranks. Huh. And so during the training, they had to behave as they were supposed to by rank. And one of the things that meant was that the officers had to know more than the crew because they theoretically had to be able to teach the crew and russell crowe gave one of the, he did two things one is he arranged for every single one of them to get a badge and a sewing kit and everybody had to show up the next day having sewed their badge on mm -hmm. and then russell crowe showed up an hour early to every training session so that by the time anybody else showed up he was a teacher and mm -hmm. i just love that i love that commitment and i love and, you know, he was trying to be a real leader on the set, which it sounds like he really was. Mm -hmm. When we had our chat with Gord Locko, he had exactly the same story to tell of Crow just occupying the status of the leader of these people, not just as a sort of momentary kind of actorly trick, but he'd really worked himself to the position where for, for the crew in character and for the crew aboard the ship, he was Jack Aubrey. And it, it, it really shows, you know, the, the investment that he put into that really pays off in the way that they all respond to him and the way he carries himself. It's really great. And the wind favors us this time. Uh, don't count your eggs before they're in the pudding, Mr. Callaway. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> we have to talk just a minute about uh, what are called Aubreyisms. Oh, good. Which is Jack Aubrey is incapable of saying a cliche, a saying correctly. He always gets it wrong. And often when Stephen is there, he plays along, but in a way that makes fun of Jack because Stephen is so unbelievably witty. And I want to read a couple of them to you of Aubreyisms. Um, Jack says, they have chosen their cake and must lie in it. Stephen replies, you mean they cannot have their bed and eat it? And Jack says, no, no, that's not quite it neither. I mean, I wish you would not confuse my mind, Stephen. <laughs> um, here's another one. You and Martin may say what you like, said Jack, but there are two ends to every pudding. <laughs> I should be the last to deny it, said Stephen. If a pudding starts, clearly it must end. The human mind is incapable of grasping infinity and an endless pudding passes our conception. <laughs> and that another one is Jack says, perhaps you could tell him to judge the pudding by its fruit. You mean prove the tree by its eating? No, no, Stephen, you're quite out. Eating a tree would prove nothing. <laughs> I'm trying to think of an analogy of, an, of another character in, in a book or a movie where they're just, you know, malapropisms like this are just part of their, their meat and drink. It's a very unique Patrick O'Brien thing. I think it's a very unique Jack Aubrey thing. It sets him apart as liking his own wit, but also really a bit of an, a regular guy. He's not the ship's chief philosopher or their scholar or their priest. He's the person who likes lame jokes. Um, and if he has any learning at all, he wears it very lightly. And I think it's a really great characterization for somebody who's going to be the leader, who's going to be Lucky Jack. If we can close this gap and get up behind us, she may well be ours. Touch wood. Scratch a stay. Turn three times. May the Lord save us all. Something we should point out, and that really doesn't show up in this movie, is as brilliant as these two guys are in their realm, they are both morons. There are, there are huge elements where Jack is a complete idiot. And the same is true of Steven. Steven on the ship is he's one of the most brilliant people in the world, but he still can't figure out which side is port and which is starboard. And that's <laughs> part of what makes these characters, their flaws are part of what makes them so lovable. At some point, maybe when we get to wrapping up, when we finally get done, we, we get to make our pitch, I guess, to listeners to the podcast to say, you should check out the books. And there's pitch point number one. The humor, the relationship between these two principal characters and all of the wit and all of the humor is something that's it's just on the surface in the movie and it's acres, acres deep in the books. So if we get the chance to make our pitch, there you go. There's paragraph one. I would like to push back on something you just said, Steve. What are their flaws? What is his Stephen's flaw? What is Stephen's flaw? Oh, yeah, there's so many. Flaws. Right, right, right. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> I mean, well, in addition to being a opium and a coca addict. Okay, fair. That's, um, that's separate. Yeah, totally. He totally is desperately in love with this woman. It's one of the things that goes on through oh, the- Oh, in the books. Even though he's this brilliant person who really knows himself, mm -hmm. he puts himself through absolute torture. Mm -hmm. for right. this woman he also has very little understanding of certain social conventions wow. particularly in the naval world like mm -hmm. he he will stumble into doing things that are really awkward like there's a in post captain jack is uh it's called a jobbing captain <laughs> so he shows up to take over someone's ship temporarily and he invites mm -hmm. steven to come with him and Jack is very nervous because he's a young captain and he wants to make a good impression on this great right. ship. Yeah. Stephen shows up in like a onesie mm -hmm. because he thinks it's more comfortable and bringing um, several beehives and like a million bees because he's a naturalist. <laughs> yes. And now yes. Jack is like, what are, you, what are you doing? Like you brought all these. He's like, oh, don't worry about the bees. And he just lets them out in the main cabin. And now there are millions <laughs> of bees everywhere. It, like there's so much more to Stephen's character. Yeah. And you can see why I'm not going to, I don't think you can criticize Peter Weir and the script writers and say uh, they missed something important because they had to make a choice to make a movie out of this. And that meant generating a hero. And that hero was absolutely going to be Jack Aubrey. But we end up with a version of Stephen Maturin that's real shallow, I think, compared to what's in the books. Well, and that's a fascinating thing, because to me, I think their relationship is so rich in the movie and so connected and so like honest and it's a rarity when you see this kind of relationship pop up in, in a film like this so to me because i haven't read the books i think they they nailed what yes. they were going for in this relationship and 100%. that steven is one of these people that won't be bullied by jack that won't be kind of run over by jack and his because russell can access that gear and it's there with yeah. jack yeah. he does his own thing right. and then he kind of forces jack to kind of look at it from a different point of view later on in the movie, right? He kind of expands his perspective a little bit in how he's approaching things. So in that way, they both give and take from each other 
because I think Jack also kind of calls Stephen out on a couple of things himself, which he has to take a look at, and which is the, right. the earmark of a great friendship, you know, being able to call each other out and then being able to concede the points or see the other person's point of view and let that affect you and change you. So, yeah, I'm so happy to hear you say that. Mm. Part of me wants to say that it's it's way more. There's way more. It's way deeper. Oh, I'm sure. It's way more complex. Mm. Way more intricate in the in the uh, in the novels and fanboys from the world of the novels like Steve and me. We can sit there going, well, yeah, it's 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 pretty good, <laughs> but they haven't really got. Mm, mm, mm. And like, he, like Steve, you said we lack objectivity here. By the standards of any movie I've seen, this is a really interesting and complex and mature friendship. And I'm so yeah. glad that it stands out to somebody who's not a Patrick O'Brien fanboy. Well, I, I think I think nerddom is everywhere. <laughs> that's not that's not that's not my Batman. That's not my Spider Man. That's not my Steven. Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. it's irrelevant. And nerdum is always functioning yeah. with anything you read, any character, any series, any fiction. You always are like, that's not my blow. You can even go nonfiction. That's not my Abraham Lincoln. You, yeah. you can go through so many facets. So you know, those things are relative throughout. But you know, obviously, yeah. read the books. You because I'm sure there are people who watch Misery who are like that's not my character from Ka- the Kathy Bates plays and stuff like yeah. that. So you just never know. But that's good to know, actually, that there's more to yeah. mine between the, in this relationship in the books. I think John put his finger on it, that that relationship is the heart of the books. That is what, you mm. know, if I never knew a thing about anything nautical, mm. anything historical, even if I didn't like Jane Austen, I love these two guys and their relationship and the way they mm. have similar kinds of relationships at different levels throughout it all over, that, that even the secondary characters are fascinating Mm. and their relationships are fascinating and the movie does some of that so john for you not to have read the books and to pick that up makes me say Mm. yeah peter weir you done good you know all everybody did good yeah and i want to add one last thing and maybe that's why peter weir was okay to cast these two guys because he understood he wasn't going to be able to put the kind of depth into steven that you see in the books yeah so why not have this already established relationship from a beautiful mind come in that way Mm. i'm shortcutting to the and the and the audience has already seen a beautiful mind, it's an Oscar winning picture, and they already can connect these guys as friends and go forward with that. It does the work for you, you know. And you, yeah. Steve, you know that as a director, sometimes the casting can do the work for you. So, yeah, that's a really great point. Hmm. We're heading into a storm. This sequence is absolutely remarkable. There are 150 shots in it, 90 of them are effect shots. Wow. They're using all the tools in the trade, including there was a period ship that was sailing around the horn called an, the Endeavor. This is just as a, as an experiment, as an adventure. And the studio found out about it. And Peter Weir said, let's put a film crew on them. And hmm. the, a lot of the storm, the actual storm footage was from a huge storm, you know, in what Jack would call the high Southern latitudes. And, the, and so it's real footage. And what's happening in this is that we have our guys on the ship, on the gimbal, in a tank where they're just getting pummeled with water. Absolutely mm. brutal. Then you have a one six size model of the surprise mm. and they're putting people digitally on the rigging and they're hitting that with water, but they're doing shooting it in slow motion. So when you shoot a model, you always shoot it in slow motion because of gravity, basically. Because yeah. if I, mm-hmm. you can tell what, size something is by how fast something drops so a smaller thing something would drop really quickly and so it's like no so you slow everything down but the problem is is water molecules Mm -hmm. they're of a specific size and so they look too big and so they're also doing all these tricks like using uh blowing hot air through them and different chemicals and all these things to try to make the size of the water droplets more correct Uh, and then this is going to um ilm and asylum who did all the cgi and they they also have created a digital version of the ship and what it's really hard is first of all they have to you know we have those 27 miles of ropes well they have to create all of them digitally and they have to match exactly where everything is on the ship it's a real and all of so we have these shots that are composited together it might be you might have an element from the actual storm, an element of our main guys on the gimbal, an element from the model and CGI elements all put together like a jigsaw puzzle to create these images that we're seeing. And it is absolutely remarkable. I took a, I took photographs on a sailing boat in, in a storm where the, the sister ship got dismastered, a real oh, honest wow. to goodness gale. And the photographs just look like a blowy day on the town lake. It's like to, <laughs> to, 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 to share and show the, the scale and the violence and the, and the forces involved. It's brilliant. Really, really, really compelling. And what we hear is that Jack is really pushing the ship. Be quick! 
Quack it off, Brazil, if you don't want it. No, Captain knows this ship. He knows what you can take. And we can see all the precautions before you go into a storm. You see the chickens getting locked down. You see the hatches getting locked down. We see all of these huge waves everywhere. We're pumping water because water is coming on the ship, so we got to pump it off. And Lamb, who is the carpenter, he is worrying about the mast. The mast can't stand up to all of this. Yeah. The shots, again, it's all just, you just feel like you're here. You feel mm-hmm. like you're in this yeah. world. By the way, one of the things that Peter Weir said to everyone as he was casting was he's like, look, this is going to be a brutal shoot. Because even here, they're in the tank. They're just getting pummeled with water all day for many days. Yeah. So he gives everyone the option, you know, if, think about this seriously before you take this gig. And of course, yeah. everybody took the gig because <laughs> everyone <laughs> wanted to work with Peter Weir. They want to be on this project. Yeah. And we see this crew member who's up on the mast and he calls down to Hollum to help him. And Hollum goes and starts to climb up, and then that mast goes down, and this guy goes over. It is such a scary moment. Everyone's calling to him, throw him something that floats you, and they're calling to him to swim. You know what it is? Again, it's kind of like the Jaws moment where the guy has the roast, and he goes into the water, and (laughs) the shark is coming behind. They're going, swim, swim, swim. That's kind of what's happening here is they're trying to get him to swim to that mast Mm. that's hanging over. And then the master says, Sir, the wreckage is acting as a sea anchor. We must cut it loose. It's going to sink us. And it becomes really, really clear that the only way to save the ship is to cut that mast free. And this guy's just made it to the wreckage. He's now thinks he's safe. Yeah. And then they are cutting the rope to cut him away. And we, and that last strand is cut and the wreckage starts to separate from the surprise and you see this guy in the water. He knows that he is going to die. And you see his POV of the ship, of the surprise, as it slowly pulls away. It's such a great moment in the movie, right? Because we've had these, it's smart. You start out with the battle. So you're establishing people's positions. You're establishing the enemy quickly. You're establishing how it got the best of them. You're establishing, you know, who's uh, who's ranked and, and whatever and who's in charge and who's doing what. Then you're spending more time with the crew. You're spending more time with these two main characters of Jack oh, yeah. and Steven. And then this situation happens. And then so now you can feel this moment. Now that you've had enough time to connect to all these characters and connect to the crew and connect to what they're going for and having a Jack Aubrey say, we're not going back to we're gonna we're gonna hunt this thing down so you understand now you're all in on this mission and to have this moment happen and have it in such painful and you even hear in the background the noise the voices he's gonna make it he's gonna make so there's even that hope that possible hope that it could happen and jack stands there for a second hands the axe to the other guy to the his his subordinate and he looks at him and it's almost like without a word it's just saying Sometimes you got to do these terrible things to survive, you know, and it, it, it's going to be painful, but we've got to do it. They chop it away. And then seeing him in the CGI, I think it works so well, like swimming in the water and then over the waves, and then he's not seen again, right? And you yeah. hear those stories about how the water took him and you just yeah. disappeared and it's quiet, right? Like when the woman at the beginning of Jaws and then whoosh, mm-hmm. once she's yeah. down under the water, you just hear the ding of the bell, the buoy. That's it. And it's like it never happened. It's insane. It's fantastic. <laughs> It's like the moment, there's the similar moment in Crimson Tide where Denzel Mm. Washington has to order them to seal off a a bulkhead and leaving people to die. And it's one of those things of like, it is 100% the right choice. There is no question that that is what has to happen. And you think about Nagel, this guy who had to literally kill his friend to save the ship. Mm -hmm. And in all seriousness, he's chosen the lesser of two evils. (laughs) evils <laughs> so the, one of the thing i want to say about this you might not want to use it the, the score here for me this score is just reaching a bit far it's vaughn williams theme on, ver, variations on the theme of thomas tallis I've, I've got a sort of metric in my head for sentimentality and scoring in movies okay um samuel barber <laughs> in platoon is just oh. the right side of the line this one was a, maybe a little bit too cheesy for me it's a great moment. Loads of people who love the movie love this moment for the score. I think the score is yeah. a little bit... A little too much. A little bit roasted. <laughs> yeah. Just take a few notes out. It'll be yeah. Fun. So, yeah. so many notes that the oh. human ear can hear. And we see the sadness in the crew in yeah. these moments after this, having lost this guy. And we go to Killick, who's working with his assistant, and he says... He's been at it again. Who's that then? The Jonah. What's that? 
And the Jonah is an unlucky person that will curse the ship. Yeah. And that Jonah is Hollem. Mm -hmm. And I think at that moment, as everyone has turned to Hollem, the crew is beginning to turn against him and blame him. I think that's as good a time as any to end <laughs> part one of our exploration of master and commander of the far side of the world. Of course, we'd love to hear what you think of this incredible film. You can visit us on our Facebook page, do a search for The Cinephiles. You can follow the show at Cine underscore files on Twitter, Cinephiles Podcast on Instagram. Please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts and leave a review there. And if you're not an Apple person, yeah, if you could still go to the Apple Podcast website and leave a review. They really, really help the show. If you want to support the show, you could do so at patreon.com slash the cinephiles. You can buy Master and Commander along with every other movie we've ever reviewed through our website, cinephiles.net. And if you want to reach me, you can reach me on Twitter at SR Morris and Instagram at SR Morris One. And we talked a lot about Star Trek. <laughs> it's strangely <laughs> enough, I have my Star Trek podcast, Enterprise Incidents, where we're going through the entire original series. John, how would people find you? You can always find me at the Roca says on Twitter and on Instagram. And if you want to head on over to Twitch, the Outlaw Nation on Twitch as well. And if you want to watch the content on the uh, YouTube channel, my own YouTube channel, it's youtube.com slash John Roca says so much happening over there. And uh, my other two podcasts as well, the Top 10 and the Geek Buddies. Gentlemen. It has been such an honor having you guys on the show. Yeah. There was so much detail about the books, about the period. It's been just a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. We're Yeah, it. thanks so much for having us, John and Steve. This is fabulous. And if people wanted to find you or listen to your podcast, The Lubber's Hole, on their journey, maybe through the Patrick O'Brien books, how would they do that? You can go to wherever you no normally get your podcasts and search for The Lover's Hole. You can find us on Twitter. We are at Hole Lovers, H-O-L-E-L-U-B-B-E-R-S. And Facebook.com forward slash Lover's Hole finds us as well. Definitely check it out. And I, I don't know how I could recommend these books more to people. I think I've pretty much <laughs> made my opinion pretty clear. But I think that is it for this week. We will be back next week for part two of Master and Commander, The Far Side of the World on The Cinephiles. Cinephiles.